Was your first uh, pro gig, uh, according to my notes, was with Tom Brown? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, not no, not really. You know, I mean, all the way, I had a, you know, I had a childhood career playing with my dad doing shows everywhere. And then all through my teens in my early childhood, I was working. So I was working with Hugh Masekela before I started working with Tom. So uh, a lot of my friends, you know, so Tom was signed to Dave Rusin and Larry Rosen's GRP Records. So Marcus did a lot of work over there. And uh, uh, so did Bobby Broom, Bernard Wright, Donald, all those guys. You know, and he and Tom was a Queens guy, so somewhere on on a on a break away from Hughes gig, then I started working with Tom because Omar Hakim was playing drums originally. And I can't remember where Omar went, but Omar left after a while, and then I started doing Tom's gig. You know, so and, you know, maybe maybe fourth somewhere in there, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it first. You know, working with Weldon and working with Hugh as, you know, in, in my late, or mid-teens, late teens, that would probably, to me, is more of my first undertakings as a professional musician outside of doing something with my dad or, you know, playing with the neighborhood bands and that sort of thing. Yeah. And how did you get involved? I mean, I guess just geographically it was part of the, the fabric and culture, but you got involved somewhat with some of the hip hop people like Africa Bombada and Oh Chris yeah. That's right. Well, I mean, you know, I, I grew I grew up in New York City at the dawn of the hip hop thing, you know, when when everything first started. I, I can remember uh there was a guy most people well maybe some people who know the history, but you know, the, the rapper started out as just a hype man for the DJ. So, and the DJ played when the band had a break, right? Now DJ is God. <laughs> but, so there was a guy named DJ Flowers. And he, his hype man was named Love Bug Starsky. Oh, yeah. Right? And so, you know, he was spinning record and, you know, Spin, spin all night long, like da 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 da, or like on and on to the break of dawn, and you know, all early rap kind of cadences. Then you had uh, Curtis Blow, who also knew, who took all those lines and put them together and sustained it. Right. Once he did that, these are the breaks. That was that was it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but just being in New York and and being around around hip hop and being around the being around those people, you know, just led to, you know, that thing. And, you know, a lot of drummers were like when the drum machine came out, a lot of people shied away from the technology. I was like, well, I'm going to get one of these things. I'm going to learn how to program it. And, you know, I learned how to play my pocket a little more stiff, like a drum machine. So I was like, well, this is what people are listening to now. This is what's going on. You want to stay current. You got to, you know, keep going with the flow. I had to learn some of these hip hop beats and, you know, but I was, you know, a fan of LL Cool J and Run DMC and Public Enemy and, and all that stuff. I, I you know, it was yeah. part of my, my listening, my listening habits, you know, a lot of musicians, R&B guys, you know, like, oh, that's not music. That's not this. That's not that. Uh, I think oftentimes what happens, you got too many people trying to tell you what something's not. <laughs> As opposed to maybe just shutting the hell up and listening and, and, and trying to figure out, like, you know, you know well, that, why. The why, you know what I mean? That's, that's a big reason why uh, they made Prince so special, too, was he gave, you know, different feeling to the, the drum machines. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And... And also using the keyboards as horns, and yeah, uh, so it didn't have to be a bad thing. No, <laughs> oh, yeah. He pushed he pushed that early technology to its limits. Yeah, you know, on and um, you know, I was one of his biggest fans. I'm sorry that sorry that man's gone. He left us way too soon. 
Yep. Yeah. Actually, I don't think a week goes by where I don't think of that. Oh, I can dig it. Yeah. Um, so a guy like Africa Mbata, though, he's a, quite an enigma. Uh, you you met him and uh, yeah sure I know Ben Bada you know I went we we did uh they used to have this thing called the UK Fresh Fest All right so I went over there with him and the Soul Sonic Force and um who else I can't remember but there were a bunch of uh, you know I guess we would be considered very very some obscure rappers that only people like there was a guy there named Captain Rock who was the equivalent of MC Hammer before MC Hammer ever existed. It was like, uh, like it, it was a rapping James Brown. He was amazing. And then there was uh, Jekyll and Hyde, who was actually Andre Harrell, was part of that. And Andre Harrell, of course, went on to become a huge uh, record executive working at Uptown Records and was president of Motown for a while. Um, there were a couple other groups who, if I said their names, you probably wouldn't know. Dr. Dre was there with his early rap group, with the West Coast group, by which I can't remember, but they were there. The Wrecking Crew? Might have been, yeah. Wrecking Crew, they had a female singer or something going on. <clears throat> and uh, so he, he was there. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I did a few shows with Bambata. Um, but it was towards the end of the, you know, the end of his popularity, I guess, even though the song Planet Rock still to this day, if you put it on a club, it will have the place jumping. But the fact, you know, he had the whole Zulu Nation thing in the Bronx. And, uh, you know, some say that, you know, it, there was some, some foul stuff going on with that, but there were a lot of kids who um, found, found their way off off the street it was so it was like 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 a gang but they didn't go around hurting people or doing anything you know mischievous or anything you know but they, they gave them a sense of community so i mean that that, that i thought that was a, a good thing you know but yeah but you know i've, I've always been around you know hip-hop people you know G, you know dj red alert and premiere and guru and you know um who else? You know, Buster Rhymes is a friend of mine. Uh, LL Cool J is a friend of mine. Uh, you know, CeeLo. You know, all you know, a, a bunch of a different, a bunch of a bunch of different people. You know, a bunch of different people. I have love. I have love for hip hop. You, you know, on, on my current record, there's definitely hip hop influence in some of the beats and and things. And so yeah, it's been a part of my life because you know, I grew up in it. Well, you and I both were talking before we got on the air. We're about the same, uh, almost born in the same month and everything. Um, so in our age group, we came up when, you know, funk and funk jazz were like at their peak. And uh -huh. then hip hop came in. And, uh -huh. you know, I still followed that because it was the extension of, that. of what we had been following. And they also sampled and used so much of that music and that vibe yeah. anyway. Yeah. So... Yeah, I love all that 80s hip hop stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Um so when did you realize, hey, I'm I'm becoming like a full fledged like session guy, you know, and, and how does that differ from doing your own thing? Um well, you know, being it's it's real simple. So being a side man or a session guy or whatever you want to call it, there's no responsibility. There's just none. So if you're on the road working for somebody, well, you have a road manager, right? It was essentially a glorified babysitter, but a, a road manager who tells you where to be, you know, you know, what time, you know, what time the sound check is, you know, where the laundry mat is, you know, you have, you, it's, it's literally no responsibility. If you're working as a session guy, you go in the studio, they either, they give you a chart or the producer says, hey, I want you to do this. And you just and you just do it. You know what I mean? When you're working for yourself, you know, and I say this all the time to people, you don't know what it's like to be a band leader or be an artist, put our records till you actually do it. It's just it's a whole nother ballgame. When I go on the road, when I have my own band, 
you know, so again, you know, I'm, I'm not making a gazillion dollars at the show. So I'm my own road manager. You know, I have a guy who drives a sprinter bus. I have a, a, a road guy, you know, sets up the equipment and all that kind of stuff. But everything else falls on my shoulders. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, to collect the money, I have to make sure that the musicians get paid. I have to make sure that, you know, if a gig gets canceled at the last minute, I have to, you know, where I'm going to find the money to pay for that hotel on the day off make sure the musicians eat on that day off, you know? So literally when I'm on the road and I'm working with my own band, the only time I have to myself or the feeling of freedom is the hour and 15 or 20 minutes that I'm on the stage playing a drum. When you come off the show or then when you get off the stage and now you have to run over to the merch table and try to sell CDs and meet and greet and talk to people and be a politician and that whole thing. And then when that's over, you got to make sure that, every, you know, nobody left anything in the dressing room and the blah, 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 blah. And, and the musicians, you know, you know, where are we going? How long was it? So-and-so, so-and-so, you know, so all the stuff I always took for granted when I was working with Marcus or working with Eric or working forever when, you know, so it's, it's a whole nother thing when you have to, you're responsible for all that stuff. You know what I mean? So just the responsibility level are to two completely different things as a side man. Very little responsibility. Just show up, play good, collect a check. As the as the band leader, you know, hope you hope and pray that you collect a check for yourself, but you got to make sure all your expenses are paid and all that other stuff, you know, all the stuff that goes into running any business. You know what I mean? So it's just the, the responsibility level is is another is a whole other thing. And trying to be an artist, uh, and especially in our age group and in this era that we live in. And doing records and doing all the stuff that I'm that I'm doing, you really have to have a passion for it. You have to have a real love love for it, because it's it's a long road, and it's a whole hell of a lot easier to play drums to Shaka Khan than it is to like work on songs for myself and make sure that it's produced properly and to make sure I have this guy and this arrangement and the blah 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 or you know paying you know. They got to get the airplane tickets. This guy wants a window seat. You know, this guy wants to make, I got to put the frequent flyer number in. And you know what I mean? Oh, now this guy doesn't like this hotel. And how come you're at this hotel? And, you know, I mean, it's just a, it's a whole other dichotomy. You know, Scott wants to interview me. Yeah. You got to yeah, There you go. I mean, Scott, Scott <laughs> just stays on my black ass constantly. Where are you? We got to do the interview. Let's go. Right. Oops. I'm knocking myself down. But, you know, so. Yeah, it's just a different, a different, a different level of responsibility, and I think a lot of people think that you know when you when you go on the road that it's just just a big huge party, you know what I mean? And sightseeing trip, you know. I have been around the world, that, you know. It's very rare that you know I've had a chance to go see something, you know. I you know you see the airport, you see the hotel. You see a sound check stage, you go back to your hotel and you play a show and then you leave. You know, but a lot of people think that, you know, you're living the life of Riley and, you know, all these, all, you know, loose women and then fast cars and, you know, all the stuff that they show people what a musician's life is in the movies. You know what I mean? And, and so unless you're some huge rock star or something like that or a huge rap star, that's not the, it's far from the average life of what a working musician is. As you know, it's a, a Disney movie it has nothing in, in common with the, what the real reality of doing this stuff on a day to day basis is. You know, yeah. let's let's get into uh, some of those artists that I named at the outset that you've worked with, especially Marcus Miller. Um, oh. You know, how does that how has that relationship like sort of blossomed, and what can you tell us that makes him such a special talent? What makes Marcus a special talent, um, I started playing with Marcus when I was 14 or 15. What makes Marcus such a special talent is he has an innate ability that you can't be taught and you can't learn. Is either you have it or you don't have it. He knows exactly what to play at the exact right moment to play it. And I have never, I've been around other guys who can do that most of the time or a lot of the time. Marcus Miller has the ability to do that every single time. And it's frightening. No, it is. It used to get my goat when we were kids and when we played together. And, uh, and I'm glad that it did because it made me, when I'm playing, 
I'm thinking, oh man, I gotta find the thing. I gotta find the the, the that one little pocket, that one little thing that no one else is seeing, no one else is hearing. I gotta find it. I gotta find it. You know, it's like a like a search and destroy kind of mission. But that's from being around Marcus. And he does it effortlessly and consistently and effortlessly. The other thing that makes him unique is that he's been able to write instrumental hit songs. Nobody singing, nobody rapping. With a couple of notes, you know, he has crafted songs that have propelled careers of Sanborn, of Miles, of Joe Sample, just with a few notes. You know what I mean? He has the ability to do that. I don't know which record he's on now, but I think it was two records ago, maybe three records ago, he wrote a song. The song's called Detroit. Song is a hit song. It's on his record, but it's one of those things. He just, you know, like Run for Cover for David Sanborn or Choo Choo for Miles Davis. He has a unique ability to write instrumental hit songs. The third thing would be his touch on the instrument. A lot of people, and it's just so funny to me when I think back on this, you know, so we have people, you know, Marcus has all these pedals on the floor, right? And all this gear and all this amp settings. And right? you have, I watch people run up on the stage and taking pictures of everything, you know, the amp setting and the blah, 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 and the pedal and where he had the distortion button and, you know, and they're doing all, and I'm looking at myself saying, you fool, you know, <laughs> and none of that matters. I said, the sound is right here. That's where his sound is. His sound is that touch on his bass. You know what I mean? Victor Bailey, another great bass player, he picked up Jaco Pastorius' bass once at Mike Stern's house. Right? And he said, man, I don't know how Jaco plays that thing. He said it has dead spots all over the place. The neck is kind of warped. and It's just unreal. When Jocko touched that bass, magic happened. You know what I mean? So Marcus has, he has the touch. He has an innate musical ability to play the right thing. And he writes instrumental hits. And, he, and, and, and he's, you know, you, he plays in E and A all the time, but you want to hear him play in E and A. You can't get enough. Just like B.B. King's vibrato, you want more. Miles Davis with a mutinous trumpet, you want more. A John Coltrane solo, you want more. A Jimi Hendrix solo, you want more. Bob Dylan lyric, you want more. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He has that thing. Not everybody got that thing. I don't know what that thing is, but he got that thing. That's what makes him unique. And why, why do you think, what, what qualities are part of your relationship that it's been such a long uh, fruitful relationship. Why? Why have you gotten along so far? I well? think. I think that. Well, I think the fact that we we played together when we were very young that had a lot to do with it. But I'm a selfless. I'm a selfless musician. So you have drummers who would play behind Marcus. <laughs> Excuse me. So Marcus starts playing a bunch of really busy stuff, right? So some musicians think, oh, well, he's playing a lot of stuff. Now I have to play more stuff, too. Right. But, of course, that turns into a conversation of two clackling hens. Right. You nobody gets nothing gets happens. Right. So when Marcus would play all this fancy stuff on the bass, I would just stay out of his way. And I was content with just playing. I gotta play a basic beat or play play whatever support lend support to whatever it was he was doing. To try to, to try to help him get his point across. So, and I enjoyed that role. I was like, all right, look, if you're Michael Jordan, fine. I'll, I'm happy to be Scottie Pippen. No problem. But there are some people, when they see a Michael Jordan kind of guy, they go, I'm, I'm good as him. I'm, I, you, I, you can't tell me. I, I, you can't tell me. Uh, I'm, you know, and, and they feel the need to exert themselves or exert their energy in a way that's just fruitless. You know, I don't, I don't participate in, in those type of things. I don't feel that I need to prove myself to anyone. 
You know, I do what I do. If you like it, that's awesome. If you don't like it, that's awesome too. You know, because if you didn't like that one, maybe you'll like the next one. You know, <laughs> Springs Hope Eternal. But you know, I'm 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 a selfless guy. I didn't have a problem with him being being you know being Robin to his Batman. You know, it didn't it didn't bother me at all. But there are a lot of musicians that's hard for them to do. To turn to turn their ego and their brain and their and their thing off, so that the music will ultimately win. And if the music ultimately wins, you won. Uh, you know, you won the Super Bowl. You know? So that's that's what I think. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, it's a great match. That's for sure. Um, what are a couple? Of, you know, I named a lot of artists you've worked with obviously we're not gonna have time to talk about all of them right. but what are one or two others that stand out you know um where you're you have a particular memory that really stands out uh unforgettable experience or there's something that you created that you're especially proud of um well um, as cliche, as cliche as this might sound um you know i'm i'm even some of the corporate and wedding games band gigs I've done, I'm, I'm, you know, I think it's it's truly an honor and a blessing to be able to do what it is you love to do. You know, many people get up and go to work every day and they can't, they hate everything. You know what I mean? But if I had to pick a couple, um, your first one would be working with Marcus all those years and traveling and seeing so much of the world and playing in front of so many people and having so many people show us love, um, playing in front of enough people that I was able to start my own career from it as an artist, you know what I mean? So that's truly amazing. I guess the other one would be working with Roberta Flack, as she is a consummate and true professional in every sense of the word. Um, I had to be able to play Whisper Quiet with the same intensity that I'd be playing at full volume. That was a very hard lesson to learn. But playing in her band, I learned that lesson. Um, did a gig with her at a place called the Westbury Music Fair. We opened for Ray Charles, right? And so Ray's uh, handlers bring Ray into the tunnel where he's supposed to go on. And uh, I said, oh, my God, you know, I might never have this opportunity again, right? So I went up to him. I said, hello, Mr. Charles. My name is Fuji Bell. I just played drums with Roberta Flack. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for making so much great music for so many years, sir. And, you know, this was, you know, like that, right? And Ray looked at me and said, well, son, the question is, <laughs> I'll never forget this, son, the question is, every music has a soul. Can you surrender your soul to the music? And then they walk way, way away. And I just stood there like, what just happened? It's like my mind just, <laughs> <laughs> my mind just got blown. So that was, that was a hell of an experience. That, 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 that little conversation I had with him and Roberta Flack made that possible. And then uh, a gig at the Pori Jazz Festival. Comes outside as Mr. Bo Diddley. And he's smoking a cigar. And same thing, I was like, man, Bo Diddley, Bo Diddley, right? Like, gotta say something. I went, Mr. Diddley, you know, so nice to meet you, the same kind of thing. I said, Mr. Diddley, where did you get the beat? Where did you get that beat, Mr. Diddley? He said, oh, the Bo Diddley beat? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that beat. He said, well, that was, was, the, that was the sanctified church women's beat they used to play on the tambourine. When I was a young boy, I, I remember that rhythm. That's where that rhythm comes from. You know, dun, 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 right? I said, well, there you go. Now I know, you know. So, you know, music has, has been, has been a, you know, one of the best things that has ever happened to me because I've gotten to meet so many people who are my heroes and people I looked up to and, you know, and, to know like Billy Cobden, like who I studied for hours, but he's a good friend of mine now. And mm -hmm. I talk to him all the time, you know? So it's so many things stand to stand out, but you know, all the years working with Marcus and the time I spent with Roberta Flack and also having dinner 
at Randy Crawford's mom's house. <laughs> that was amazing. Right? Because uh, everybody knows Randy as a kind of a reserved singer, right? And uh, Randy's mom said, Randy, why don't you show them how you really sing? Right? I went, huh? Right? So Randy said, well, okay. And she started with the most melodious gospel voice I have ever heard in my life. I mean, just like huge and wide and warm and and was could sing all the gospel runs and do all the stuff. And she just did it for a split second. She said, I said, wow. Right? She said, well, I don't do that, though. <laughs> okay. You know. Also, they made some of the best soul food I'd ever had and ha probably ever had in my life at, 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 uh, at Randy Crawford's mom's house. So that, that was a beautiful experience. What and city was that? Yeah, I mean, you know. What, what city was that? Oh, Lord, it was somewhere down south. I want to say Mississippi, but it's not right. But it felt like Mississippi. But it's not Mississippi, but it was somewhere deep in the south. Mm. Somewhere deep in the south. But that was, that, was a wonderful, that was a wonderful experience. But I've had a lot of those type of experiences, man. You know? Um, music is a great job, as I'm sure you know. If, if, you, if you can survive... You know, the rough times, the, the good times, uh, make the, all that rough time, all them rough for a while. You know, it, ju it just does. It just does. Yep. Let me ask you uh, a little bit a uh, technique question. Okay. What's the key in your mind to being a really good funk drummer? Uh, I mean, obviously, you got to be in the pocket, but can you add more to it than that? Um, I think the key to being any, 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 any the funk, whatever music is the feeling behind the note. Like I said earlier, um, being able to, I think too much is made about technique just to, to begin with you, to be honest with you. There are great, great people who have technical powers to play with lousy feeling. Art Blakey had some of the worst technique I've ever seen on a drummer, but it felt real good, you know. So I think the most important thing that any musician can, can do, if you have if you have technical ability and you can make that technical ability make if make make people move people with it, and because what you're playing with it feels good, then you've won. But if you have a lot of technique and it doesn't feel good, no one cares. If you can't move somebody, if you're playing drums especially. If you can't make somebody's body move, foot pat, you know, head wiggle, then you're not you're not doing a good job. You need to start. You need to work. Focus more on your your feeling than than the technical powers behind the thing. You know what I mean? So, and playing the sound out of the drums, like I said earlier, as opposed to playing the sound into the drum. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to be a great funk drummer, if you specifically want to be that, all right, well, you have to spend hours practicing the Parliament Funkadelic records, and you have to spend hours practicing to Ohio Player records. Diamond from the Ohio Players is the perfect example I'm talking about. He doesn't have the greatest technique in the world, but whatever you think he plays feels good. Jerome Bailey from Parliament Funkadelic, he didn't have the greatest technique in the world, but everything he played felt good. You know what I mean? So you, you, you have to listen to those guys and you have to, you know, you have to to understand and appreciate what it is that they're doing in order to be able to to get to it. A lot of people listen to funk or listen to reggae or they listen to blues drumming, sometimes even listen to like country and western drumming. Like, well, there's not a lot going on. There's not a lot of notes. It's not fancy. That's the whole point, you know, and to be able to see that and to get that. And to be able to capture that spirit um, in your own and unique way, you know what I mean. But if you're going to be a funk drummer, if if you're not listening to the guys who created the music, if you're not listening to to, to the, all the great James Brown's drummers, if you're not listening to, you know, Al Jackson, and if you're not listening to the guys who all the great Motown drummers, if you're not listening to those guys, you, you're never going to get it. And if you're listening to just fusion 
drummers or if you're just listening to guys who play in nine, eight, and seven, four, and for funny odd time signatures and stuff and play a lot of roles, you're, you're never going to get it. You know? But if you have a good understanding and basic technique and a strong foundation, then reaching out and doing all those other type of things is easy. You know what I mean? You know, I can go seamlessly from a funk gig to a reggae gig to I did a I did a movie thing not too long ago. I played bluegrass for eight hours in a day. I didn't even know I could play bluegrass for that long. And I essentially played the same beat over and over again, just at different tempo. Because that's what, what that music was. Did you use the brushes? I use brush, brush, brushes, brush and stick, brush and mallet, brush and brush, brush and hot stick. I did every version. Of of the choo choo train on a snare drum that a brother can do. I did, but but then it started dawning on me. Just started dawning on me. Even you know within that, there were a whole bunch of different choo choo trains to play. It was like, oh well, no, there's there's a chugga chugga chugga, there's chugga 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 chugga. You know what I mean? It was you know. But again, that's from being open minded, open ears, not being a musical bigot, and not saying, well, this is beneath me. I shouldn't. Why am I doing this? This is not, this is, this isn't good. You know, I mean, I don't, you know, those people like the jazz police and the, and the funk police and the hip hop police, everybody who wants to tell you that this isn't real funk and this isn't real rock and this isn't real country and this isn't, where do you find the time for all that stuff? It's like, boy, you got a lot of free time. I, you know, I got to make sure my teenage son isn't doing some crazy teenager stuff. I, you know, much less like decide what music really is and isn't, you know? It's like, wow, you got a lot of free time, you know? Hey, back here with Pooji again. Uh, we had a brief break. That explains his uh, warmer attire change. Yes, yes, yes. Trying to stay warm in the basement, as it were, on the northeast coast. That's right. It is winter time here in the northeast. Well, I'm in the south, but yeah. Um, so let's uh, jump into your... your um, discography as you know your own artist um i think at the outset i mentioned that you had five albums under your name but i think you actually have six uh one called thinking outside the box another one called get on the kit that's two another one called my america another one called Puji on shuffle one called sugar top and the last one was called, I uh, can't remember what the last one was called, damn. Exhibition, I got it here. Exhibition, exhibition Continues. So, yeah, it's, it's six. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so first one, as you said, Thinking Outside the Box. Right. Um, I mean, that's where you set the, the tone for just, you know, this run that you've done of these great jazz, funk albums that have, you know, a little bit of almost everything mixed into them. Um, right. What... What took you so long until 2004 to finally do one on your own? And uh, what, you know, went into making it happen? Well, I think it was the realization um, that I was not getting any younger and that, uh, that which is always a, a, a real realization. And, um, and if I was going to do something on my own, I had to have a calling card. So I had to have a record. You know, so uh, the first record, the Thinking Outside the Box record, I put a band together when I moved back here to Pittsburgh and I was doing going out and playing on the jam band circuit. So uh, bands like Soul Live or Snarky Puppy, you know, playing to a young hippie kind of crowd, um, uh, which is interesting because George Clinton actually ended up playing to a lot of the crowd. Anyway, um but in order to get a booking agent and to get like proper paying gigs, I had to put a record together. So the thinking outside the box record, I literally had no clue of what I wanted it to be or what, you know, the band had a few original songs and I took those songs in and, um, you know, tried to add on to that mm-hmm. concept of what, you know, of, of, of that, that my version of what jam band music is. So there's a lot of people, uh, there's a couple songs on there. So there's one called uh, UG Ballad and a song called Soul Neo and another song called Boogie Hustlers. Those have probably gotten the most spins on Spotify or wherever. 
the people seem to gravitate to that. But the idea was that, you know, if I was going to have a band, I knew I had to have a record, long story short. And, and so, you know, you had to start somewhere and thinking outside the box <laughs> where I started. When I listen back to it now, I go, oh, gosh, you know. But you why, know, why do you go, oh, gosh? Well, because I just, I really didn't have, I didn't have a clue of, of direction. So the, the record just kind of goes all over the damn place. And like, uh, I didn't have, like, you know, in my house now, you know, I got, I don't know, probably eight or nine grand worth of like gear, but it's like good, good at, you know, at home, you know, professional pro gear. When I was making that record, you know, I, I did a lot of it at a, uh, a hip hop production type of studio, um, which, you know, is run by a guy named Eric Dan, um, the rapper from Pittsburgh, uh, Wiz Khalifa. Uh, this is where he came from. And, um, but anyway, so I did a lot of that record over there. And, uh, you know, you know, Eric's a great, great producer and a, and a good mixer, but, you know, he mix, you know, mixing hip hop and mixing like somebody playing a sax solo is two different things. You know what I mean? So a lot of the mixes are like, yeah, you know, the mastering, it's like, yeah, it's, it's okay. You know what I mean? But it's just start, you know. How, how long about did it take you to get it together? Uh, by the time I got to the third record, which is Sugar Top, I knew what I wanted to do. And even though, I mean, there's people who really like the, the get on. Well, I, I actually, sorry to interrupt you, but I meant actually, how long did it take you to get that first record together? How long did it take? Oh, man, it took over a year. Yeah, I figure it took a long time for the first one. I'm guessing. Yeah, it took it took over a year because I mean, you know, you work a little bit and then you run out of money and then you know run out of ideas or which you know whatever came first, running out the ideas or running out of money. Um, and in fact, I got a loan, um, a very very gracious loan from the bass player at the time. His name was Kevin Barefoot in the band, and. Um, his pop, God bless him, his pop loaned me 2500 bucks so that I could finish that record. If I had not gotten that loan, chances are good I wouldn't have <laughs> never would have finished that damn record. You know, because it was, you know, you know, my wife was looking at me like, you know, you need to go on the road and so we can pay these bills. You know, I mean, this record thing is cute and everything, but come on, you know, you need to go do your job, you know. And uh, so I was I was very, very fortunate and very, very blessed that he was kind enough to take mercy on me and loan me a little bit of bread in order for me to finish that first record and get it printed up and so forth and so on. But like the cover is bad. I mean, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, just, just looking at the cover. It's just, the cover is not good, you know. It's just the artwork is bad, and you know. <laughs> well, hey, you got to so, you got to start somewhere. I mean, you gotta, yeah, man, you got to start somewhere. Um. I think, you know, you were jumping to the third one to saying when you finally started getting it where you want it. But um, to me, I thought there was a, a, a big jump just to get on the kit. You know, I mean, that one was get a on, solid record. Get on the kit um, was probably the, the best that, that that version of that band ever played. And I really, really, I was working at a better studio. I really took time with the... Uh, Paint uh time with the like the editing and and uh, I was really listening a lot to I can't remember the name of it but I was listening to a Steely Dan record uh, a lot at that time and um, and I was really just enjoying the the Steely's uh, you know perfectionism type of thing so a lot of that kind of like boiled over into the, the, the that record, you know. And in fact, the most popular song after the record is a song called Breeze, Breeze Word. Um, uh, can't remember. If I said the name of the song, you would know it. But there's a Steely Dan song that starts off with a, kind of a quirky guitar part. And 
I can't remember the name of the song. Don't get out of there. I can't remember the name of the song. Uh, it's not. It's not off the. I, I think it's off the Asia record. But anyway, the Breeze Word song was the first, the last two chords of that Steely Dan song. I just put them together and we put a melody over top of it. Hmm. Yeah. I'm sure a viewer, a viewer will post what what that song is. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. And you had Wawa Watson make an appearance. Oh man, Wawa man, what what's a warm, such a warm and beautiful soul and human being Wawa Watson was, man. You know, great, great conversations with him. You know, um, in 2006, we played the, the JVC Jazz Festival in Japan, and Herbie Hancock was there with uh, one of the first reinterpretations of the, the Headhunters, and Wawa was there. And uh, so me and Wawa met up one day at breakfast and just started talking and and became really, really, really good friends, you know. And uh, it was an honor and a pleasure, you know. Same thing, you know. I reached out to him and said, "Hey, man, look, I got, I could buy you a slice of pizza. About the best I could do. I could play some drums for you, but I really would love to have you on this song." And um, I also think it didn't hurt that the song that he played on was a song uh, that Marcus gave me, and I was really, really surprised that Marcus gave me that song. I wasn't expecting Marcus to give me a song on that record. We were someplace, I think we might have been in Greece or somewhere. Marcus said, hey, man, come to my hotel room. And he played this, played the, that track for me. And he said, what do you think? And I said, yeah, sounds good, man. You know, sounds very, very cool. He said, well, I wrote it for you. It's for your record. And I went, wow, man, thank you, you know. And... um so I told Wawa, I said, look, man, the song I want you to play on is the song that Marcus wrote, right? And so Wawa was like, Miller, Marcus, what? Man, all right, I'll play on that song. You know, Pooch, you need to tell Marcus to hire me, man. You know, it's one of those type of things. But he was he was a gracious and beautiful uh, dude. Uh, one of the last times I saw him, I actually went to his house in L.A., and he was very, very neat and orderly, you know what I mean? And that uh, chronologically, so he had everything he ever did, like on dats or cassette tapes, and they were all in alphabetical order and all this. Like, and he started pulling out stuff. Well, this is me and Ray Parker, and this is me and so-and-so, and this is me and so And he had all this amazing music. And I was like, well, what are you going to do with this music, he said. One day I'm going to release it and just devastate the world, <laughs> you know. And uh, I was really surprised. Like the last record that he made was more like a smooth jazz record because he had songs from like Herbie Hancock periods and songs with Ray Parker singing lead vocals on them, and he had so much cool stuff. And he never put any of it out. And I, I wonder. I often wonder what happened to that material of his wife whoever one day put put that music out but it was there was some amazing i mean like mind-boggling things that he had like with different players and oh this is one with, with marvin gay and this is one with so-and-so and it's like what i said you have yeah i got all this i got it on this i got it on the dat i got it on the so-and-so i got it on real the real i got you know but he never put the stuff out Wow, and you know what? I was uh, pursuing him to get him on this show, right. uh, and so heartbroken not to be able to get him. You know, he was quite quite the individual, man. He was quite the individual, quite the individual. Um, and what a unique sound and 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 niche oh my he oh. filled in you know contemporary jazz and and R and B from the seventies through the nineties. Yeah, one of a kind. 